Good. Good morning, men and women. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, friends and neighbors. Good morning, saints and sinners. We got it all covered. Glad to have you here. Come on in and have your seat. Make yourself at home and let's uh, prepare to glorify God and enjoy Him forever this morning. Uh, if you have a cell phone with you, I bet all of you do, turn that thing off. I'm mad, I'm mad at cell phones. And so uh, do yourself a favor, do us all a favor, and turn the thing off. Jesus said, uh, can you not watch and pray for one hour? Jim says, can you not turn the cell phone off for one hour? <laughs> so thank you for your cooperation. If you have young children that need to go to the bathroom, now's the time to do it. We would uh, appreciate that as well. Landy Campbell. We salute you this morning, sir. Great to see you. Landy's been through a rough patch of surgery and so forth, and I didn't know you were going to be here today. It was great, great to see you. Uh, we are in the process of nominating elders and deacons, and uh, the forms were in your bulletins the last two weeks. They're not there today, obviously, and they won't be there next week, but they are at the information desk. So if there's still somebody you'd like to nominate, you may avail yourself of one of those forms. Homework. Yes, a very important homework assignment. As soon as you finish lunch, get on the website and make your reservation for lunch two weeks from today. Our patriotic uh, celebration will be great. Tom Beasley will be sharing a testimony. Tom's a West Point uh, graduate, 1966, Vietnam uh, War veteran, highly decorated member of our church. And we look forward to him speaking and some great music and a uh, special prayer for our nation and then great food and fellowship afterward. But this is going to be catered you're not going to have to wait an hour and a half on the food truck. <laughs> We're going to improve on that. But we need to know what you want to eat. So there's some options. So everybody clear on that? Homework assignment, do it today, this afternoon. We've got to get these numbers uh, well in advance. And please do invite some friends. It's a great outreach opportunity. We'd uh, love to see a good turnout right here in the middle of summer. Uh, last, but uh, certainly not least, happy Father's Day. Stand up, fathers. Let's give them a hand. Stand up. <laughs> fathers and grandfathers, we're not clapping for you, Kent and Jill. You just happened to walk in at the right time. <laughs> you know, you just leave it to these guys. Eh? Yeah, it's all right. Uh, program note, come on in. Program note. Um, uh, one little change here for those of you that are, are detail-oriented. Uh, the Manning girls will be blessing us during communion, piano and violin, and so we will enjoy that, which means that uh, you see Ferris Lord Jesus, David German during Breaking the Bread. That's gotten booted uh, up to the prelude, and uh, Finlandia, I guess, just totally got booted, so... Come back next week for Finlandia. Let's uh, prepare our hearts to worship our God and King.
God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so you shall drive them away. As wax melts before fire, so the wicked shall perish before God. But the righteous shall be glad. They shall exult before God. They shall be jubilant with joy. Sing to God. Sing praises to God. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord. Exult before him. He is father of the fatherless and protector of of widows. He is God in his holy habitation. Let us praise the Lord. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 471. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we live in, a, in an unstable world, a shaky world, a world where it feels like we're constantly in storms and earthquakes, but you have given us in the midst of this shaky world a steadfast faith, a faith that began with your servants Adam and Eve as you clothed them with garments of skin to atone for their sin, and it has been carried on through Abraham Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and all the great figures of the Old Testament through King David and the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter. This faith has been steadfast for millennia, and so we cling to the faith of our fathers. More than that, we cling to our Father who is in heaven. We bless you for calling us your children. We bless you that you have given us the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And so we come today as hungry children, as needy children, as children who love their father and ask, feed us, fill us, encourage us, 
uh, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading now comes from 2 Samuel chapter 14. And we'll read verses 21 through 28. Then the king said to Joab, Behold, Now I grant this, go, bring back the young man Absalom. And Joab fell on his face to the ground and paid homage and blessed the king. And Joab said, today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord the king, and that the king has granted the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, let him dwell apart in his own house so he is not to come into my presence So Absalom Absalom lived apart in his own house and did not come into the king's presence. Now in all Israel, there was no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he cut the hair of his head, for at the end of every year he used to cut it, when it was heavy on him, he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head, 200 shekels by the king's weight. They were born to Absalom, three sons, and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a beautiful woman. So Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem without coming into the king's presence. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you'll take your bulletin in hand, you'll find in your order of worship now a general prayer of confession. We will uh, corporately confess our sins aloud to God. After that, we'll have a few moments of silence so that we can silently and individually confess our sins. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, please forgive us of our many sins. We are sorry for the many times and different ways we have presumed upon your grace, forgotten your benevolence, and grieved your spirit. We come humbly before you that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, hear the prayers of your people and have mercy upon us, sinners. For we ask this in Christ's name, amen. Amen. I'm going to answer the one burning question I know that you all have. How much hair did Absalom have? (laughs) It's about five pounds that he cut off. It's a pretty impressive uh, head of hair. I thought about The old model Fabio, if you remember that guy, as I was reading. Anyway. (laughs) But thinking about Absalom, uh, the son of the king, made me think of a Samuel Rutherford quote. We have a room right outside of this fellowship hall named after Samuel Rutherford, great Puritan preacher and author. He said that when we struggle and doubt and complain, uh, we are like newborn princes weeping in the cradle who know not that there is a kingdom before us. If you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, as he's offered to you in the gospel, not only are your sins forgiven, but you've been adopted into the family of God. You are a child of the king, and there is a kingdom before you. And when you're tempted to cry, as uh, 
Kevin Elko likes to say that we're all ducks. We quack a lot. We just quack, quack, quack. We, you know, we're always feeling sorry for ourselves, always complaining. Rutherford says, you're a child of the king in the cradle. Remember there's a kingdom set before you. And he's, Rutherford also said, this is another quote of his, faint not, the miles to heaven are but few and short. So if you're a believer today, receive God's forgiveness. And remember, you're a child of the king and the miles to heaven are but few and short. There is a kingdom before you. And if you receive God's forgiveness, let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. The last uh, nine months or ten months now, our sixth graders have been studying the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Catechism uh, is basically fallen into disuse among believers these days written back in the 17th century at Westminster Abbey it's part of the constitution of our church we find it to be a wonderful summary of of uh, Christian doctrine what the Bible teaches and so uh, we want to call these kids forward and uh, let them show you a little little taste of what they have learned um, so Canaan cross you come stand right here Canaan and next to Canaan, Elijah Sarlo. There he comes. And I'm going to let you hold that, okay? Are you nervous? <laughs> Your parents are more nervous. <laughs> uh, Noah Sarlo. Will Siri is out of town. Did he do that on purpose? Did he leave today so he wouldn't have to do this? <laughs> we'll just get him up here by himself. How about that? Uh, Luke Thomas. Why don't y'all scoot down a little bit? We'll get you centered. You know, we're on TV these days, so Luke, down there by uh, Noah, if you don't mind. That'd be great. Thank you, sir. And Stella Whitfield, last but certainly not least. How were, how were your teachers this year? Were they good? Okay, we're going to see if they were really good or not, all right? So since Will's not here, uh, I've got a lot of questions I can pick from. This big, thick book, you know? And uh, since Will's not here, I'm going to ask all of you just to answer this one, pretty basic, but what is the chief end of man together? Let's try that again. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Right, good. We're off to a great start here. Let's see if I can ramp it up a little bit. Um, Canaan, I'm just going to lucky dip here, or unlucky dip as the case may be. Here's a big question for you. Where in? Consists the sinfulness. Let me try that again. Wherein consists the sinfulness of that estate wherein to man fell? I should come stand over here. The sinfulness of that estate wherein to man fell consists of the guilt of Adam's first sin, the want of original righteousness, and the corruption of his whole nature. What is commonly called original sin, together with all actual transgressions which proceed from it. You knew that, right? You knew that. All right, if you hand the microphone off to Elijah there, and I'm going to lucky dip a little more and ask this fine young fellow, what is the sum of the Ten Commandments? The sum of the Ten Commandments is to love your God. All right, you're hey, they, they don't know the answers anyway, so just... You know. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the Ten Commandments is to love your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with, with all your strength, with all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Excellent. Well done. Young man. All right, Noah. What is justification? Justification is an 
<laughs> Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardoneth all our sins and accepted us as righteousness sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and, rece- and, and received by faith alone. Great. Amen. That's a important question. All right. Uh, Luke, there's mounting pressure here. You know, nobody's messed up yet, so... Luke, what is prayer? Prayer is the offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ for a confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of all his mercies. Beautiful. Beautiful. I want you to know I I do have the answers here and uh, it's been perfect so far. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. All right, uh, let's see if I can find one really challenging one here for, uh, for Stella. <sighs> Stella, let's see. I just, uh, you know, I really like you a lot. And, uh, <laughs> well, the one I had picked out for you, let's see, it says page, see page 142. I tell you, while we're waiting, I, I know of another one. Um, what, uh, who are your two favorite preachers? <laughs> the only ones I know. <laughs> I thought that was a slam dunk, but you know. We'll get back to the catechism, okay. Let's try this one. What is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace where a sinner, out of the true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, doth with grief and hatred of his sin, turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor of new, after new obedience. Bingo. Beautiful. Well done. Y'all did great. Thank you, Scott and Denise, for being excellent teachers. Luke, stay up here if you don't mind. We'll let the rest of you go back to your seats, and now you can relax. Now, Luke uh, has never made a public profession of faith, and so uh, having been taught the doctrines of our holy religion, as he was this year, he now comes before you to make that public profession of faith. Uh, Elder Mike Miller interviewed him, and uh, I think all went swimmingly, and so... Congratulations, young man. We're happy to welcome you formally to the family of God. Pastor Heath is going to ask you some very important questions. I'm going to ask you five questions. You've already heard them. Just answer with I do. Do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure, and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy? Do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners, and do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you? Do you resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becometh a follower of Christ? Do you? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Do you? Do you respect the government and discipline of the church and promise to promote its purity and peace? Do you? Let's stand together and pray for Luke and these other kids, and uh, then we'll remain standing and sing our next hymn. Lord, thank you for Luke. Thank you for his family. Thank you for your spirit and your work in his heart and life. And uh, we know that no one can ever say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so... We praise you for working in his life and for the solid foundations that have been laid and may his parents and friends and we as a church family build on this foundation with gold and silver and precious stones to the end that he would grow to be a great man of God, a servant of yours who would uh, follow you all of his days, serve you and serve uh, your people and uh, worship you with great joy and thanksgiving. So continue the good work that you started in Luke. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. God bless you.
Amen. Please be seated. And as you're seated, allow me to welcome Lewis Coddington here with his wife, Elsbeth. Lewis and I go back at least 40 years. And uh, these are missionaries in the truest sense of the word, have been serving the Lord in foreign lands uh, as long as I've known them. Uh, China for a number of years, uh, more recently South Korea, ministering to North Korean defectors. So right there on the front lines of battle, strong believers who raised how many kids? Nine kids, yeah, so, and uh, still kept his hair somehow, I know that, so. Come forward and uh, bring us a good word. We're glad to have you here. Well, thank you so much for inviting us to be with you. I, I love to see the way you all are building a strong foundation in the youth. That's wonderful. I hate to think of what I was doing at that age. I was running around outside or something. I don't know. <laughs> But that's wonderful to see. Uh, we, we have been working overseas for over 30 years and uh, in different places. And we just thank you for your support of us in, in the recent years. Most recently, we've been working with North Korean defectors, kind of an unusual group. They, they sneak out of North Korea and eventually find their way down to South Korea. So we've been in Seoul, South Korea, working with these North Korean defectors, teaching them English and teaching them the Bible. And it's been very interesting. Um, they're an interesting group because they're very traumatized. They're a little bit like Holocaust survivors. And I just want to tell you a brief story about one of my students, just to give you a feel for what North Korea is like. North Korea is a very dark, oppressive country, probably the most in the world. So please pray for them. Pray that uh, God's light will get into them. But I had, I had one student, just a real sharp, nice guy. His name was Brian. And after they get to know you a little bit, they open up about their story. And one day he just blurted out, he said, when I was a teenager in North Korea, one of my buddies got a hold of a pirated DVD, and that's very dangerous. That could get their families into big trouble. So they watched this DVD together, and it was the World Cup soccer championship. You know, not, not a big deal, we, we wouldn't think. Um, but as he was watching that, he saw the Australian team playing, and as soon as he saw them, he thought, I want to get out of here. I don't want to raise a family in North Korea. And the reason why he said that is, and this just gives you a picture of how dark it is there, he thought everybody in the world up to that time spoke Korean. And he didn't know there were all these other countries. So when he saw the Australian team, he suddenly realized his country had been telling them a bunch of lies and he didn't want to raise a family there. And so that's how those people are living, just in great darkness. And um, I'll let Elspeth share a few prayer points with you. Um, I do love stories, and uh, I've put some of our stories into this book. We have it out in a table out there. You're welcome to pick one up if you like little stories. It has a picture of our nine kids right on the front. So <laughs> help yourself. Well, we just sang, let me just read one verse of the song, Faith of Our Fathers, that we just sang together because it's very pertinent to North Korea. Faith of our fathers, God's great power shall draw all nations unto thee. And through the truth that comes from God, his people shall indeed be free. What you probably don't know is that Kim Jong-un, the current president of North Korea, who's not yet 40 years old, his great-grandparents were believers. His great-great-grandfather was a pastor. There was a huge revival in North Korea in 1907, to, so much so that Pyongyang used to be called the Jerusalem of East Asia. And so what I want to ask you to pray for, and pray boldly with me for this, that the gospel that once shone bright in North Korea would be rekindled. There is an underground church there. There are people that still know the truth, but they are completely oppressed by their government. 
And so pray that the remnants of God's word that is still there, or the efforts of people like Voice of the Martyrs Korea, which sends balloons with Bibles into North Korea, and they have radio emissions into North Korea, or even that the, that the created world that God says in Romans 1, 19 and 20, that the witness of the creation can indeed show who God is. So somehow the God will bring his truth known to that country. So please pray that the people of North Korea will be set free spiritually. And also I want to ask you, secondly, to pray for the families of the North Koreans that we know. If you go out and look on our table, we have a a board, all the students on that board that we knew when we were living in Seoul. There's more than 33,000 defectors in South Korea, and we met so many of them that we were privileged to teach. They're wonderful kids. They're very ostracized by the South Koreans, even though they're the same race, but they are ostracized because their language sounds different. It's been frozen in time. People can tell that they're not from South Korea. And so they're ostracized, they can't find work, they're marginalized, they're looked down upon. Very, very sad when you finally get your freedom. But pray for the families that are behind, left behind. They can't, find, they can't have contact with them, many of them. If they do, they pay $200 for a phone call through a broker from China who has a Chinese cell phone. That's how they can finally contact their families. Very, very oppressive. And then the third thing that you may have heard glimpses of recently is that COVID has swept through North Korea. As we knew it would, Kim Jong-un was sure that it wouldn't. He locked up his country two years ago. It came. Thousands, millions of people are sick with COVID. Medical care is virtually non-existent. And the people are all starving. They're all malnourished. And there's a huge famine going on because of typhoons and poor harvests. So North Korea is desperate. We are so blessed in our country. So much of, we don't even think about the rest of the world, but please don't forget North Korea. Pray for the North Koreans that, that the truth will shine and that people will become free. And if you're interested in learning more about North Korean defectors, there's a paper like this on our table with a list of a bunch of books that we have found. They're almost all available on Amazon. There's even a Netflix drama you can watch about North Korea. Please educate yourself about North Korea and please pray. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Come over here, uh, Lewis and Elsa. Let's, uh, you've given us a lot to pray about. And uh, am I right that you all are moving toward retirement? We're getting close. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and planning to retire on Lookout Mountain, is that right? Great place to live. Bow with me in prayer. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for uh, the reminder of how blessed we are here. And thank you for Lewis and Elsbeth and others like them that you put in, uh, in strategic places all over the world. We're thankful you have your people everywhere. And we do pray for North Korea. We pray for um, the revival to break out. Uh, we pray for you to even use the COVID outbreak to cause people to uh, look to the heavens, uh, to see uh, your invisible attributes, your divine power, your eternal nature, and to know that uh, you are God. Uh, the heavens declare your glory, the earth shows forth your handiwork, and so may people look and see and be convicted and be convinced and come to faith in Christ. And bless those who are separated from their families. We pray that in your marvelous goodness and providence, somehow you will reunite them. And in the meantime, that you will sustain and bless both parties. And for all those who have defected to South Korea, and uh, we, we just thank you for their freedom and pray that they will find even more freedom in Christ. So we, uh, th th this is our Father's world, Lord, and these are your people. And so uh, bless them and save them and uh, bring down uh, rulers that are wicked and oppressive and replace them with godly uh, leaders all for your honor and your glory so thank you for this these uh, fine people and their family all those children and how they all serve you and uh, just continue to bless lewis and elspeth in the in the days to come and use them for your honor and glory through christ our lord we pray amen god bless you and thank you very much thank you God bless you. Once again, we'd like to welcome you to Stevens Valley Church. We're glad you're here with us this morning. 
If you're sitting on an inside row here, there should be an attendance pad, a black pad there. Would you please, please pass that, uh, sign in, let us know that you were with us. We would appreciate that greatly. I have a few announcements uh, before we continue with our service. The first one is a reiteration because I had multiple people tell me that this needed to be hammered home. And I'm going to do it in the form of a quiz. If you are planning on eating July 3rd after the worship service, what do you need to do as soon as possible? Sign up, register, all acceptable answers. Um, yes, please sign up for that uh, as soon as possible. And speaking of registration, while you're there signing up, you can also sign up for our Wednesday night fellowship meals uh, that we're having through the month of June. We're, I'm teaching a Bible study. I'm calling Apologetics, How to Speak to Skeptics. And we've just been discussing what's kind of going on in the world and how Christians can communicate their faith in a secular age. You are invited, cordially invited to that uh, fellowship meal and Bible study, uh, but we do ask that you register for the meal just so we have a general idea of how much food we need. Uh, one other one that was pretty pressing that I needed to point out to you, there's at the very end of our order of worship, after the uh, postlude congregation standing, there's a note there about the King's Brass. This group of musicians will be here with us this coming next Lord's Day uh, to bless us with, with their gifts and help us in our worship. There's a note at the very bottom of that announcement that we need some housing for some of these folks. Is it four houses, David? That we, we, we still have four individuals who need a place to stay. So if you have an extra room and you could house one or more of these individuals, we would love for you to do that and we need to get that locked down, settled down pretty quickly. If you can do that, speak to David German or uh, email him. His email address is in the bulletin. Other than that, we have numerous Bible studies going on this summer. If you're looking for a place to get plugged in and study the scripture, we would love to have you join us. Uh, and we will now receive God's tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. We bless you, O oh God, our Father and our Creator, our Provider and our Sustainer. And we thank you for your bounty toward us. And now we give back as an offering of gratitude and ask that you would use these offerings for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Please turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. I know it's almost 11.30. My stomach's growling. I'm going to try to get right to the point. I should have had Lewis preach today since it's a sermon on fathering, and he, he, uh, he and she raised nine of them and did it the right way and kept their hair in the process, and so... Most of what I learned uh, being a father was learned by trial and error, a lot of trial and uh, a lot of error. Um, lost a lot of sleep, a lot of hair, and a lot of sanctification as well. But I believe churches are suffering today, and um, families are suffering, and the country is suffering because of what some have called the feminizing of our culture and the war on fathers. We're told that men and women are basically interchangeable, that men are just hairy women with different plumbing who need to get in touch with their inner selves, 
and that two men can raise a child just fine, or two women can raise a child just fine, or a single man or a single woman can do it just as well as the old-fashioned fuddy-duddy way of a husband and wife or a father and mother. Uh, I don't have recent statistics, but uh, I do know that in the year 2005, 1.53 million babies were born to unmarried women. And if you're like me, 1.53 million doesn't really register until you realize that's twice the size of Washington, D.C. and approaches the population of Philadelphia. So in one year, a whole Philadelphia was brought into uh, our country. Um, babies, children without fathers. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we look to you to save us, save us from ourselves, save us from folly and nonsense and pride and selfishness and uh, bless the nuclear family and bless the, the order that you have established. And uh, to that end, we we pray that your spirit will be our preacher today, that we will all have ears to hear for Christ's sake. Amen. <clears throat> Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. I realize that not all of you today are, that are here are fathers, but we all have a father, and we all should care about uh, the nuclear family and the order that God has uh, established. Aside from being saved by the grace of Almighty God, I would say that being a husband to a wonderful woman and raising five children was the greatest privilege of my, still is the greatest privilege of my life. The house is a lot quieter now. Uh, the house is a lot cleaner now. But I do at times miss the noise. I miss uh, the life. I miss the toys that were scattered uh, hither and yon throughout uh, the house. Um, I miss the ball games. I miss the the um, recitals. I miss the plays. I miss their friends coming over. I miss sometimes. I even miss some of the silly arguments the kids got into, and um, the proms and the homecomings and all of that. Um, so it, it passes all too quickly, as as uh, as many of you know. Kids say crazy things, our link letter told us, and we, we found that to be true in our family as well. I'll never forget the time when our kids were, from oldest to youngest, 13 years apart. And so our oldest daughter, Kristen Faith, was a freshman at Ole Miss when our youngest son, John, was uh, just starting kindergarten. And uh, Ole Miss was playing Alabama that Saturday morning, I'll never forget it, watching that football game, and I was really interested in it, and John kept bugging me like a tick on a dog. Ever I sat down, he was all over me. And I just wanted this kid to go away for a few hours. But finally I said, John, just sit still and watch the game. And maybe we'll see Kristen Faith. And he, he turned, he looked, he watched. Got real quiet. After a few minutes, he, uh, he turned back and said, Dad, which color is Ole Miss? I said, they're in the red jersey. He watched some more. Finally, he turned to me and said, Dad, what's her number? <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. I don't miss the trip to the trips to the uh, principal's office and headmaster's office and teacher's conferences and uh, conversations with policemen and attorneys and the like. Uh, we did have a little bit of that too. But as John Bunyan once said, the bitter must come before the sweet. And that makes the sweet all the sweeter. The Apostle Paul gives us uh, both a negative and positive instruction here. 
We'll look at both of them quickly. The negative, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Uh, your version may say do not exasperate your children. Do not frustrate your children. There ain't no, any number of ways that we can do that <clears throat> because we fathers are sinners too. Uh, we can be too passive, married to our work, and fail to engage with the family. King David failed to discipline Amnon, his son, who had raped Tamar, his daughter, and they all paid a steep price. We can anger our kids if we're too prideful and never accept responsibility for the wrong things we do, never repent of our sin. We can frustrate our children if we're emotionally aloof, if we don't love their mother well. We can exasperate our children if we're blatantly hypocritical. Or should I say when we're blatantly hypocritical? Joe Nobinson used to tell the story about the young preteen Jewish boy who, who greatly admired his father. <clears throat> uh, they lived in Germany. They went to synagogue regularly. They worshipped in their home some. But one day they moved and they, they uh, were in a different city. And lo and behold, the father took the family to a Christian church. And in time, the boy grew to love it. And he so admired his father, and he so admired the person of Christ, that he wrote as a teenager these words, Union with Christ imparts an inner elevation, comfort in affliction, tranquil reliance, and a heart which opens itself to everything noble and great. Not for the sake of ambition or desire or fame, but for the sake of Christ. It produces a joy which the Epicurean seeks in vain in his shallow philosophy and which the deeper thinker vainly pursues in the most hidden depths of knowledge. That's good words for a teenager. <laughs> but then time passed and the boy discovered that his father didn't really believe these things, that he just... He just uh, joined the church for some personal business uh, interests that he had. And uh, over time, he grew cynical. And uh, he eventually rejected religion altogether. Later, would call it the opiate of the masses. And wrote a book you're familiar with called The Communist Manifesto. Such is the price of hypocrisy. Fathers that play favorites will anger their children. Jacob had a favorite son. His name was Joseph, and there was a lot of pain. God worked it out for good. We know the story, but there was a lot of pain for a lot of people because Jacob had a favorite son. Fathers who are stern and unforgiving likewise can anger their children. King David, Heath read earlier, refused to see his son Absalom for two years after he brought him back to Jerusalem. And they hadn't spoken for three years before that. So for five long years, the king had no communication with his own son. Are you surprised his son later led a coup to overthrow his father? There are a number of things that fathers can do that wrongfully exasperate their children. Which is not to say that children shouldn't be angry at times because there are times when we must discipline and correct. That is what love does, right? Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And whom fathers love, they will discipline as well. But otherwise, do not wrongfully exasperate, frustrate, provoke your children to anger. The positive Secondly, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We can fail in a lot of ways, and we do. But if we'll at least strive to saturate our children with the Word of God and satisfy them with the love of God and surround them with the people of God 
and uh, seat them in the worship of God where the sacraments of God are observed, I think you can sleep better at night. There is no magic formula, of course, but we do know this. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of God stands forever and never returns void, but always accomplishes the thing that God intends it to do. It may take years, but it will bear fruit. The Apostle John said, I have no greater joy than to know that my children are walking in the truth. And believe me, your children can be highly successful, highly talented, highly gifted, and receive all manner of awards and recognitions and the like, but it will be very hollow indeed, empty, if you are a Christian parent and your children are not walking in the truth. Saturate them with the Word of God and surround them with the people of God. One of the best things we ever did was completely accidental. I mean, we, we were so dumb, we didn't really know what we were doing. But we opened our home, and we had so many Christian people in our home it might have been somebody was speaking at the church. It might have been a guest uh, missionary. It might have just been church members. It might have been church visitors, any number. But we always had people in our homes who were Christians. And you know what our kids discovered? They discovered that other people were just as crazy as their parents were. <laughs> and other people believed the same stuff that mom and dad believed. And there was a collective power in that that we had no idea was, was even going on. By the way, along the way they learned to talk to adults, which is a nice thing for kids to be taught because far too often, I don't have my cell phone with me, but far too often you see kids these days and their noses are almost attached to their cell phones. Get those things out of the way and teach them to speak to adults. And it's very much a blessing, particularly when those adults themselves are strong believers. We brought our children to church every week. And, uh, you know, we heard it. Oh, Dad, do we have to go to church today? Yes, you do. <laughs> Monday morning school was non-negotiable, and Sunday morning church was non-negotiable. And once they figured that out, they began to make the best of it and make a few friends and have a good time and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior. We prayed with them. We prayed for them. We read Christian books to them, the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, children's version of the Pilgrim's Progress. We, believe me, we were very, very imperfect parents. We weren't very good about those daily devotionals. Uh, for example, or reading through the Bible with our children. But there was this saturation of the Word of God through the home and the church and the, the circle of friends that we had and that they had, and God was pleased to bless that. And, and by the way, our home was seldom very clean. I'll say that because Kristen's not here today. <laughs> But we had five kids and two dogs. Your house doesn't have to be perfect before you open it up and invite others in. And it'll be a blessing for all of you. Our kids learned some of the catechism. I don't know if they'd have done as well as these did this morning, but if they learned nothing but the first question, what is man's chief end? It is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. You've done something wonderful for your kid for your children because today children, youth, sorry to say this, but they are taught that they have come from nothing and are going to nothing and that this life means nothing. And what does that do but produce despair and disillusionment? Why are we here? We're here because God put us here and he made us in his very own image that we might glorify him, that we might exalt him, that we might make, it, make his name great, 
enlarge his name and glorify and enjoy him in the process. It's not to be a drudgery. It's to be the greatest joy of our lives. To worship him and serve him and know him and know that he's loved us with an everlasting love. And to enjoy this beautiful playground he's made for us. Do you enjoy the mountains? Those are his mountains. Do you enjoy the beach? That's his beach. Do you enjoy your academic success? It's his mind he's given you. Athletic success, that's his gift to you. Paul says, what do you have that you have not received? You know the answer to that question? Nothing. <laughs> Everything we have, we have received from him. And best of all, the unspeakable gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we always want to be pointing our children to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's no greater joy than to know that our children are walking in the truth. Some of you have heard this before, but years ago when Ronald Reagan died, President Reagan, his son Michael spoke at one of the private services. And I want to read a little bit of what he said. You knew my father as governor and president, but I knew him as dad. I want to tell you a little bit about my dad. Ronald Reagan adopted me into his family in 1945. I was a chosen one. I was a lucky one. In all of his years, he never mentioned that I was adopted, either behind my back or in front of me. I was just his son, Michael Edward Reagan. When his family grew to be two families, he didn't walk away from the one to go to the other. He became a father to both, to Patty and then Ronnie, but always to Maureen, my sister, and myself. We looked forward to those Saturday mornings when he would pick us up, sitting on the curve on Beverly Glen as his car would turn the corner from Sunset Boulevard, and we would get in and ride to his ranch and play games, and he would always make sure it ended in a tie. We would swim and ride horses or just watch him cut firewood. As the years went by and I became older and found a woman I would marry, Colleen, he sent me a letter about marriage and how important it was to be faithful to the woman you love. He added a P.S. You'll never get in trouble if you say, I love you, at least once a day. I was so proud to have the Reagan name and to be Ronald Reagan's son. What a great honor. He gave me a lot of gifts as a child, a horse, a car, a lot of things. But there's another gift he gave me that I think is wonderful for every father to give every child. Last Saturday, when my father closed his eyes for the last time, I realized the gift that he gave me, the gift that he is going to be with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He had back in 1988 on a flight told me about his love of God, his love of Christ as his Savior. I didn't know then what it all meant. But I certainly, certainly know now. I can't think of a better gift for, my, for a father to give a son. And I hope to honor my father by giving my son Cameron and my daughter Ashley that very same gift he gave to me. Knowing where he is this very moment, this very day, that he's in heaven. And I can only promise my father this. Dad, when I go, I will go to heaven too. And you and I and my sister Maureen that went before us, we will dance with the heavenly host of angels before the presence of God. So fathers, raise your children in the discipline and instruction or the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You will be glad you did. And so will your children. Lord, we, uh, we look to you as the perfect father and know that you love to give good gifts to your children. And we have been the blessed recipients of those good gifts, the unspeakable gift of our Savior, the gift of your discipline, your reproof, your correction, the gift of your love and faithfulness, the gift of your word that never returns void, the gift of your Holy Spirit who convicts, 
comforts, teaches. Comfort us all, we pray, and bless our families. And bless those who mourn. We pray for Alaska, darling, and, and Leslie, darling. And we pray for Matiku Adisu. We pray for Sid Gilchrist, that all these will have the peace that passes understanding. Uh, continue to grant strength and healing to Bill Kinney and Landy Campbell and Tim Cummings and Sid Gilchrist and um, Clarence Sutherland and Darlene Hargrave. Bring peace to the world. We think particularly of Ukraine. And I uh, pray that you would save those people and bless them, and the Russian people as well, the North Koreans. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. So we come now to the Lord's table, and uh, first off, if you're visiting with us and you're going to take the Lord's Supper, uh, you, will have, you will find that two cups are stacked together. You will only take one. There will be one stacked within another, and you'll pull them apart, and then you'll have the bread and the cup. And uh, also, the Lord's Supper is an, an ordinance, a sacrament of the covenant of grace, and it is meant for believers. So if you're here today and you're not a believer who's put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'd ask that you just last, ask the, let the elements pass by you and not partake of them, uh, because Scripture opens up to this, this table to those who believe. Talking about families today, I think everybody knows it implicitly, even though we might not be good at practicing it, that it's important that families eat together. It's important that we share a table and that we sit together and have table fellowship and of course, God is a perfect father, so he prepares a table for his children, for his family to come and partake in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, his only begotten son. And this table is open, thinking of Michael Reagan and adoption. You know, God has, we, our salvation is called an adoption because he not only saves us, he adopts us into his family to eat table fellowship with him and with his son. That's what we're called to today. So as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, thank God that you're a part of the family of God and rejoice in your adoption through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner after the supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the remission of of sins. Drink from it, all of you. And as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns.
Those young ladies can play, can't they? By the Lord. The Lord's given us a good day. We thank you for being here. We wish you and your families the best. I'm sorry we've kept you over time. Let's just stand and sing the first stanza of our last hymn. May the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit descend upon each of you and dwell in your hearts forever. To all God's people say, Amen. Amen.